Hello, and welcome to the next in our series of plant science seminars powered by ASPB. My name is Mary Williams, and I am your host for today's webinar. Today, we feature two speakers, Byung Ho Kang and Yang Song Miao, and our moderator for this webinar is Li Wen Jiang. We have organized today's webinar as a celebration of the January 2022 focus issue on cell biology of the journal, The Plant Cell. This focus issue is edited by Dolph Vigers, Magdalena Bezania, Li Wen Jiang, Adrian Roeder, and myself, Mary Williams. And we hope that it will be online within the next couple of days. We have a second webinar also featuring authors from this special focus issue scheduled for January 25th at 4 p.m. GMT, featuring two additional authors from the this focus issue, Magdalena Bezania, Joke de Jagger Brait, and hosted and moderated by Adrian Roeder and Vijaya Batala. This webinar will be recorded and posted on our Plante YouTube channel, where you can find it and many other excellent plant science talks. I would like to give a special thank you to our ASPB member attendees. This, this series is sponsored by the American Society of Plant Biologists. ASPB members always get priority registration for Plante webinars. And if you would like to become a member, we have a code PRESENTS10, which you can use to receive 10% off your membership dues. Please put questions for the speakers into the questions box. And if you have technical problems, you can let me know through the chat box or email me at mwilliams.aspb.org. If you're having connectivity problems, try joining again or check your internet speed or try dialing in. So now I'm going to turn this over to Li Wen, who will first introduce the focus issue and then introduce today's speakers. So thank you, Li Wen. Thank you, speakers. I look forward to the seminar. Thank you, Mary. So hello, everyone. My name is Li Wen Jiang from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So on behalf of the focus issue editor, I would like to welcome you all to the Plante webinar webinar highlighting plant cell focus issue on cell biology. So we all know that the plant cell published its first issue in January 1989. So this month, the plant cell present a focus issue on cell biology. So in this focus issue, we go back to the roots of the journal and the basics for, the, for its name, turning our attention to the many fascinating facets of the plant cell biology. So this focus issue contain 11 review papers and 11 original research articles highlighting both established concepts and research uh, recent achievements. So today we have two excellent speakers, okay? So the first speaker is uh, Professor Belhan Kong. So Belhan is an associate professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He received his PhD in 2003 from the University of Wisconsin Medicine under Bernard Sebastian, and also worked as a postdoc from 2003 to 2007 at the University of Colorado under the supervision of Andrew Stainline. So where he learned electron microscopy. So Belhan joined the University of Florida as an assistant professor in 2007 and served as the director for the University of Electron Microscopy core facility until he moved to Hong Kong in 2015. So his group started membrane dynamic involving in the cell wall polysaccharide secretion, recycling of damaged mitochondria, and assembly of a thylakoid in plant cell using 3D electron microscopy. So Belhan, the time's all yours. Uh, I, I think uh, the uh, Mary should stop sharing the screen so that I can share my screen. Oh, I have stopped sharing. Yeah. 
good. We see a, a sun arm. Okay, good. It's there. So is our uh, screen okay? Yeah. Okay. So thanks for the opportunity to give a talk uh, uh, in this webinar series. So as this is for promoting the plant cell special issue on plant cell biology, uh, I will introduce um, microscopy techniques characterizing architecture and functions of plant organelles uh, in, this, um, in my presentation. So I begin with an image of a plant cell where uh, we can see a diversity of plant organelle. Uh, this is a, a plant cell undergoing vacuolization. As EM sections are thin and volume we are seeing so small, it's not easy to have so many organelles in one side in one image. And we, here we can see nucleus and multivesicular body and mitochondria. I mean, this is getting enlarged, so some of them have been moved away from the view, but uh, it has a Golgi and TGN and other organelles. Uh, so this is also the cover image of the special issue. So this, maybe I can show you again. So where, oh, uh, this is the image where we can see mitochondria, vacuole, and Golgi and nucleus. So for studying plant organelle by microscopy, there are two main modes. First is light microscopy, and the other is electron microscopy. So light microscopy utilizes the visible light as a probe, and because of the wavelength limitation, um, that is a re uh, the resolution cannot be better than uh, 200 nanometer for conventional light microscopy. And this image shows a kind of lower mag and uh, the but uh, more, of a, more of a comprehensive view of a cell. And because plant, our cells are mostly transparent and do not interact with visible light very much, usually we stain particular structure. So we can visualize selectively particular protein if you make GFP tagged version as in this image. Uh, and here, here uh, the Golgi stacks are labeled with GFP and several is stained with red dye. And we can, and because we can image in under ambient air pressure, uh, we can do the live cell time lapse imaging. By contrast, electron microscopy or uh, electron beam is utilized for probe, and we can manipulate wavelengths of electron beam. Uh, resolution can go as low as two nanometer, about like hundred or two hundred times better than light microscopy. But the limitation is the fact that we have to image under vacuum. Uh, because the electron cannot fly long distance in uh, ambient air pressure. So cells have to be fixed and stabilized so that they survive in vacuum. Also, electron cannot penetrate thick volume, so they have cells have to be sliced very thin. So uh, volume that we are seeing is very limited. And in, the, uh, in EM samples, we usually stain with uh, heavy metal uh, because um, the small atom constituting the cell do not interact with electron very well. So any structure that is observed by heavy metal stain can be visualized. So like, uh, most of the macromolecules that we can be, uh, recognize can be seen like, uh, and uh, usually membrane and ribosomes are most abundant structure. So we can see mitochondria and vacuum and Golgi and these, all these things uh, without special labeling. And we can make some serial sections of 3D technique to make like 3D uh, the models like this using electron tomography that I will explain in later slide. So uh, in cellular electron microscopy, I mean microscopy technique for imaging cells, there are some advances in 1980s and 90s. Uh, and they include high pressure freezing and electron tomography that I do in my lab. And they have advantage over conventional electron microscopy techniques, which are so high pressure pre uh, the preservation of plant cell close to the native state in case of freezing, then a uh, chemical fixation. And second is uh, because freezing is so quick, uh, we can immobilize the fragile or short-lived structure by high pressure freezing. And second advantage of electron tomography is uh, we can generate uh, the virtual rep replica of the cellular structure in the cell in computer consisting of voxels. We can do a lot of uh, the numerical measurement, which we call morphometric analysis. And also we can visualize or automatically recognize uh, cell membrane and we can generate surface 3D models of membrane where we can examine uh, structure in the cell in multiple, uh, from multiple direction. So first I will talk about advantages of a high pressure freezing. 
So these two are electromicrograms of plant cell. So uh, one is uh, preserved by conventional application, and the other is by high pressure freezing and subsequently free substitution. Um, so uh, from like freezing technique in like a freeze fracture, we know that cellular membranes are very tight and smooth. Uh, and but in chemically fixed cell membranes are zaggy and wavy. And in plant cell, vacuoles generate turbo pressure. So plus membrane has to be pushed toward the cell wall. But in chemically fixed cell, membrane is separated from the cell wall. And also cytoplasm has a lot of empty space from which uh, cellular constituents have been extracted out. Uh, these issues of like a plus membrane and like jiggly membrane and extraction of cytodolic content could be alleviated by high pressure cooling as shown in this image where plus membrane is oppressed toward the cell wall. A membrane like mitochondria and ER, very smooth and tight. And ribosomes and the intercities between ribosomes have some like granular texture, which corresponds to like macromolecules in the cell. So we can fix the problem. Uh, second, the immobilization of fragile short lived structure. So by high pressure freezing, we can see um, phenomena or structure that were not observed in plant cell before using high pressure freezing. So one example is COP2 vesicles. COP2 vesicles are vesicles that mediate ER to Golgi transport. Uh, this vesicle has never been observed in chemically fixed cell, but after high pressure freezing, we were able to see this about 16 nanometer diameter vesicle budding from the ER and transported toward the sheath side of the Golgi. And they, it turns out that they had COP2 coat machinery uh, component in the vesicle, as in this uh, mic micrograph. These are called the particle that labels COP2 component. Second example of the stylacoid decision in dividing chloroplast. The chloroplast originates from cyanobacteria and they divide by binary fission like their uh, product, uh, their ancestor. And a lot of uh, knowledge is known about a machine, a ring structure that uh, constrict and sever the outer and inner membrane of the chloroplast, but basically nothing's known about of uh, uh, the machinery that uh, pinches and then cuts uh, the thylakoid inside in the stroma. So this is the electron micrograph of chemically fixed cell in the P leaf, where this uh, the outer inner membrane seems to be undergoing division, as it's shown in the peanut shape. But thylakoid looks like kind of normal, but in high pressure frozen cell, uh, uh, we can see these big changes in thylakoid structure in the middle plane, where uh, the outer uh, clock plus out envelope membrane is being constricted. This is image from uh, Arabidopsis leaf, and where we can see this like peanut shaped chloroplast, where thylakoid seems to be highly uh, like like pinched. So in higher magnification of the area marked by red uh, rectangle. We can see this thylakoid membrane become really kink. And even in higher mag, we can see changes in the membrane area. So this membrane has some black dots. And these are P PS2, photosystem 2, that make thylakoid granite stacks. And we can see this all the way into the near the middle plane, but they seem they disappear. So this uh, big uh, changes in thylakoid membrane suggest that there is a machinery or ring that uh, constricts the thylakoid before inner and outer membrane come in and then have them ready for the final uh, fission. And then they can push this PS2 complex away from the division site. So this has never been shown in uh, chemical GPS either. And this uh, deformation in thylakoid during uh, chemical fixation and processing could also be seen in another example. So this is a paper from Catherine Olsen's group in 2006 about study of uh, FGL, which is uh, the dynamin-like protein targeted to stroma. And in this mutant, uh, she saw changes in thylakoid structure as in these two electron micrograph. This is a wild type chloroplast where you can see stacks and then uh, uh, stroma thylakoid interconnecting the granite stacks. But this stack structure has been a kind of disarrayed and, but they are still have some stacks and they're interconnected. So she could not tell you exactly what was going on by electron micrograph. 
but uh, several years ago, we examined this mutant with a high pressure freezing, and we found out that thylakoid fusion has been affected in the mutant. Uh, in this wild type, the grana stacks, and they are interconnected by unstacked uh, stroma ramelli. But in the mutant, we can see these really tall stacks. And you see they make a spiral structure and they do not interconnect to each other. So they keep making stacks and become a really tall spiral structure. And they are completely independent from other long stacks. And this defect in FGL mutant was further confirmed by another group studying uh, FGL also logged in claim the monads. So these are. Uh, examples um, indicate hyperbolic freezing is methods that preserve itself better than conventional chemical fixation. So now I shift the gear to the electron tomography technique, the way we can reconstruct a uh, 3D structure of a cell uh, in the plastic or maybe frozen cell by uh, some mathematical technique. And to illustrate the power of electron tomography, I will use the example of prolamella body, uh, which formed the crystalline structure in etioplast. So before actual analysis part, I will go over what a uh, pro prolamella body is. So this diagram shows a uh, chloroplast biogenesis during germination. In the seed, they have a proplastid, uh, which has very primitive thylakoid. Uh, when they germinate on the light, this proplastid undergo like programs to make uh, chloroplast that are to become photosynthetically active, which take about five days. But if this seed was germinate underground or darkness, they first uh, make etioplast, which is a developmental array arrested state, so that they can quickly turn into chloroplast when light become available. So they, when they germinate, they have a long hypochordal, and then in this chordon, which is not green yellow, uh, yellow color, because they do not have chlorophyll yet and they have a lot of this etioplast in there and they quickly turn into chloroplast when uh, light is eliminated. In electron micrograph, uh, we can see thylakoid structure of etioplast, which is really interesting. So they have unstacked prothylakoid and this prothylakoid interconnect crystalline structure called the prolamella body. And it shows a repeating structure as if they are semi-crystalline structure. So this structure has intrigued the electron microscope from early days of like uh, 1960s and 70s. Uh, this is an uh, electron micrograph of a, a book by Gunning, Brian Gunning and Steer uh, in 1996. These images are actually from their paper in 1970s and uh, even 60s. So these are chemically fixed etioplasts where you can see this crystalline structure per lamella body. And because EM is a two-dimensional uh, projection and the discrete structure is a 3D, they had to uh, guess what the 3D structure is like from these 2D images. From these uh, projected images, they thought this could be primitive cubic made of square cubic unit structure from this image. Or when they saw this uh, hexagonal structure and then tetrahedral unit, they thought this could be voltite, which is hexagonal close packing as in here. Or this could be zinc blended, like cubic uh, close packing, like uh, zinc blended, like, as in here. They can make this cubic structure, but depending on the angle, it could also be square like this. And so they like uh, guessed the possible crystalline structure based on 2D images. And in fact, this is zinc blended type is same as carbon atom in the in diamond. diamond. So electron tomography as, uh, is a 3D reconstruction technique. So uh, e electron tomography is very, um, like a, will be very useful for determining crystalline structure of prolamella body. So, uh, and I was not the first person who thought that uh, there is a Polish group who actually did uh, electron tomography of it was a runner bean or something, some bean etioplast uh, electron tomography, but this is a chemical big sample and where the stroma has been already extracted out, the membrane could have been a little bit damaged, but they made the tomography and then they saw the hexagonal structure. And from this, they said in the paper that this could be vertite made of hexagonal plane, uh, stacked 
over each other. Yeah, although this is uh, two layers, two layers constitute the uh, one single uh, unit cell. So on 2016, so I, I was also interested in uh, PLB uh, electron tomography. I, I tried a tomography of high pressure frozen ETO plus, which shown here. And then I made a tomography, but I was already quite disappointed by the quality uh, because uh, stroma of the etioplasts are densely packed with a lot of like, proteins and other molecules. So when I took an image, the image was so kind of dark and then signal to noise level in the image was not so good. So when I reconstruct them into tomography, image contrast is poor as shown here. I can make out this hexagonal lattice structure, but could not tell what's going on very well. And as you can tell, the images are kind of like pixely. So I had to come up with another method to improve this. So the method I thought of was a scanning mode of electron tomography. So instead of collecting images that uh, have penetrated uh, the, the section with the image screen, it can then, uh, collect, count the number of electrons that are scattered from each point. So it's a bit like confocal microscopy where each pixel are scanned one by one. So rate of electron beam is scanned the entire field. And then this detector will count electron that deflects away by head metal in the section. So this actually can increase the uh, image contrast and signal to noise in thick samples or heavily stained samples, which I will show in this image. So this is a plant cell where we can see Golgi. And I tested the image with this mode. And then as you can tell, dark structures get a lot darker and white area becomes a lot wider. So if I show higher magnification image, so this is two vesicles of associated to Golgi, but their staining got a lot darker. And there is a downside, it's resolution is a little bit uh, compromised because electron is deflected away and, it, and then it, uh, the resolution is determined by the beam size that illuminates each point in the section, but this can improve the image contrast. So which I need for automatic segmentation and computer generated crystallized structure. So I did STEM mode, and then this actually indeed improved the image contrast. And a student of mine uh, in the lab uh, wrote a script in MATLAB with the image processing tool to convert this, convert to this PLD into automatic segmentation of structure. And then it's uh, each uh, linear component in the, uh, the PLB will turn into skeleton model. And we determine the another point where the tubules are branching out. And this uh, PLB was turned into skeleton model. And it is a higher magnification of this one. And we were able to find a projected view from this skeleton model that matched phase centered uh, cubic carbon, uh, cubic cross packing, which is a uh, cubic diamond structure. So you, and this is number one. And I mean, you can find this in the internet. So you can, we can, we were able to find the projection view of each Miller, Miller index plane that matches this uh, cubic diamond structure, which is not vertite. So you, using this, uh, the, the mathematical method, we can make uh, the model in the computer that we can do some uh, the analysis uh, of the complicated structure. So before ending my talk, I'll briefly go over identifying objects in the electron micrograph. As I said, the, the heavy metal stains like many things, it's not easy to tell uh, what molecules are there and what organelles are there unless you have a, already know something. So how we can identify objects in electron micrograph? Uh, some are visibly identified like cytoskeleton, nuclear pore complexes and some vesicles. But if you want to localize the macromolecules, uh, you have to do immunoglobulin labeling. But downside is that not all antibodies work with immunoglobulin labeling. And also they detect molecules exposed on the surface. It's not stable for rare proteins. So this is an example where we can visually locate nuclear. This is tangential section of a nuclear membrane where we can locate nuclear pores. And this is cross section of a nuclear membrane. We can see outer and inner membrane and nuclear pore. I and mean, you can locate a component of a scale, scaffold of the nuclear core with immunoglobulin particles. So we can do this type of work. But what I 
my lab is doing this, uh, the developing this, have developed and developed this as a correlative technique. What it is, is we first localize the protein in light microscopy, either before fixation or post fixation. For before fixation, we can do live cell imaging, but which is not very stable for plant cells. But a post fixation, we can do localization of a protein either in own section or in section, which I'll explain in the next slide. And once we localize particular protein or micromolecules in the sample, then we can revisit the area marked by the molecules in the light microscopy uh, after heavy metal staining. But one issue is the aligning two images, the light and electron micrograph, because they show two, two different uh, information. We have to align them, uh, which is a big problem in um, mammalian tissue cells and mammalian uh, cell samples. But unfortunately in plants, we have cell work, which is very clear uh, in electron micrograph and which can easily be stained by like cellular staining dye quickly. So we can use cell work for aligning sample very accurately. This is an example. This is a root cap cell in uh, Arabid office where we stain the cell work and other macromolecules in the cell. by align. This is a fluorescent micrograph of these two cells. And then after staining this section, we took image of these two cells and we can align this to localize where this red dot or green dot goes in TEM section. So uh, one example is this. So we can see GFP in a section as in here. And once we examine GFP, uh, so we can label this with a secondary antibody conjugated fluorophore and then the on section, we can merge them and we can take a TM image and we can overlay them to find out this GFP as well as this molecule labeled by LMA goes there. And this is matching electron uh, immunoglobulin labeling. So basically showing the same information. So I developed this technique because there is some discrepancy in electron microscopy and light microscopy. The reason is in light microscopy, we identify organelle by associated macro protein. But in electron microscopy, we identify organelle by the ultrastructure. So there is some discrepancy what these organelles do and what their structures are. But I think a clamp can bridge the gap between the two. So I will skip this structure because I'm running out of time. So this is kind of take home message that I want to uh, give, give, convey you uh, from the webinar. So combined use of uh, high pressure freezing and electron tomography, we can study like a fragile and short lived intricate membrane structure and scanning mode of ET can improve quality of the and heavy lifting sample. And I guess a correlative light and electron microscopy can or reveal subpopulation heterogeneity in plant organelle by bridging the uh, gap between structural definition and functional definition of plant organelle. Uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge my lab people in CHK, and I'd like to thank Dr. Riven, uh, not Riven, uh, <laughs> Mian, uh, Jiden Mian, who did the, the pro lamella body work. And I, I'd like to use this opportunity to thank my collaborator and mentor uh, from Colorado, where I work with the electron microscopy, Andrew Stelly and Ding Su. And I'd like to thank Li Wen for like, uh, having all these in, uh, resources that I can use to collect this data. And I'd like also to thank In Hwan and Young Su in Korea uh, for like a collaboration publication and also getting some money from South Korean government. So these are funding sources. Okay, so this is my end of my talk and thanks for your attention. And I can take some questions and also uh, during the uh, talk, I mean, you can type your question in the question or chatting board that I can answer. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Johan, for a very nice talk. I've learned a lot, okay. So please tie in your question. We do have five minutes for question, okay. So that there's a question on the Q&A boxes. The question sure. that the student or the person asked about if the cultural condition can affect, you know, the, the, the behavior of the plant organelles. Uh, cultural condition. Uh, yeah, so I, so you mean the uh, cultural condition in effect or what type of effect? Yeah, the organelle may change it during the, the culture, you know, when you under stress, uh, with the different medium or what, what should we do? Uh, so yeah, I, I try for high pressure freezing. Uh, I try to minimize. Yeah, that 
that's true. So the growth condition and those can affect structure. Uh, uh, and uh, so if plants are stressed, it turns out that they are more uh, sensitive to uh, the, the, the cutting and those processing that before we do freezing. So uh, yeah, so I have seen uh, many changes that are caused by different uh, growth conditions. So you, that's why you have to clearly state what condition you have to you grow before fixation. And another thing is before high pressure freezing, you have to uh, pick, uh, cut and freeze them quickly because uh, any damage done before freezing cannot be undone after freezing. So. All right. So there are two related questions about the claim correlator. Did they want more detail about the methods? I think you could refer them to, to read your paper, right? The remove paper. Oh, yeah. We, we recently had a book chapter uh, about yeah. the claim that we do. So yeah, I can uh, give uh, uh, the, the yeah. And if they want, so, I can send you the book. Yeah, yeah. For, for, for those who have that question, maybe send an email to Bellhorn and then he will share the, the recent yeah. methods of publication with you, okay? So actually, yeah. I do have one or two questions about, you know, the, I know many people, the lab, they don't have high press freezing, right? So yeah. what, what what do they, what, what do you expect from them using the chemical fixation? Would that be a okay or? Uh, so it depends on the resolution you want to go. So if you, the resolution that you want to uh, discuss or report uh, in the paper is like more than um, like a, a 200 nanometer or something, you can still use chemical fixation. Uh, but if you are talking about resolution ranging might be 10 or 20 nanometer, I guess it's important to use uh, high pressure freezing because those uh, small uh, changes can easily be happening during chemical fixation. So it's all dependent right. on. A follow up yeah. question. It's so really nice this step uh, ET model, right? So would you yeah. expect if you, you carry out some cloud EM study, would you see better resolution? Of the model would be different, or would, would it be the same? Um, so they there is a pay cryo EM uh, data about PLB after isolating them from mage or I don't remember what was it a barley. Uh, major or spinach etioplast. So, but they uh, were, so the problem I think they had was um, they couldn't do enough thickness to see the crystal structure. So they were mostly focusing on the edges where they want to see the, uh, the, what was it? Uh, they want to see the uh, poor, poor A enzymes and other complex than making the structure, but they didn't, uh, characterize actual crystalline structure. So because you have to have enough thickness to determine the, uh, to be the structure of the crystal. But uh, if I, we want to do it in vivo, I think a special uh, sample preparation technique is needed. Okay, yeah. two more questions, okay. Looking into the future, do you think we will be able to bring and achieve the live cell image, the dynamic and the high resolution microscopy closer together, just like EM and the live cell image together. What, what do you think in the future? So uh, that one is mostly tried with a uh, mammalian cultured cell that grow on the surface so that one can easily recognize the cell that they examined in the live microscope in the cryo EM. But in plant, uh, it's not that easy yet because uh, finding the same cell in plant tissue or plant cell culture is still a challenge. So if we can develop a technique to find the same cell, we can do those type of like real live cell and cryo EM uh, correlation. So right now we do have this kind of cryo FIP, cryo ET, right? Cryo claim yeah. working together. That, that would be the one direction, okay. So one yeah. last question from the check box. I think maybe you need to go through it with, with that. Uh, the person is it possible for Belhan to go through his data on VHA localization? Does the claim technique support teaching and localization? So these are maybe we 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 I mean, I suggest the person go go to talk to Belhan directly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, time's up. Okay. Thank you again, Belhan. Right. So we Thank move you. on to the to the next speaker. Thank you again, Belhan. Belhan. Okay. Thank you. All right, so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Yan Song Miao, okay? Yan Song uh, worked on interdisciplinary research focused on fundamental mechanism by which 
uh, molecular condensation and mechanical force regulate signal transduction in chaotic cells. Okay, he did his, did his PhD actually with me in CHK, working on plant endomembrane trafficking. He was then what in David Dubin's lab in UC Berkeley as a human frontier science program postdoc fellow. So at Berkeley, he studied actin cytoskeleton assembly uh, in budding years. So since 2015, he has led his own group at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore and become an AMBO global investigator in 2020. So Yan Song is all yours. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Zhang, for the very nice introduction. So let me uh, share my slide first. Um, so can you see the full screen now? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, thanks everyone for attending the seminar. And uh, first I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizer, the Prancel, for inviting me to this uh, fantastic uh, Plante webinar series. And uh, today I'm going to share with you about uh, our uh, works in the plant science in the past uh, couple of years, doing how, uh, trying to understand how the molecular condensation, micromolecular assembly regulates the uh, signaling event in the plant and, uh, and how we started this signaling activation by understanding the uh, acting cytoskeleton remodeling. So um, first, uh, uh, talking about the plant innate immunity is a very complex uh, uh, system. And uh, I want to go to very much detail because a lot of people know this kind of uh, uh, the structure talking about innate immunity. What fascinated me about this field is the spatial temporal regulation about the process, how the pathogen and the host interact with each other in a stepwise manner. For example, at the initial stage, the microbe can, can give some molecule perceived by the receptor on the host plasma membrane and the conformation of change will trigger some molecular assembly and then cause the called the pattern triggered immunity. And after that, the bacteria will inject the effector proteins. And most of them are actually uh, the like a dynamic flexible uh, polymers. And then they go to everywhere trying to hijack the, and subvert the host system. Then the host need to give another strategy to sequester them and even to kill the whole plant cells to stop this kind of uh, uh, pathogen, the spreading. And then they used the, either the tur like uh, uh, LRR or the coil like the LRR <clears throat> for the recognition. So something similar in between those kind of immune response is about uh, there's a process of the molecular interaction, recognition and assembly happening. And this kind of process actually it's uh, conserved in the mammalian system as well. And when you have the immune cell recognizing the, for example, in the cancer cell, the antigen presenting cell, the antigen on the cancer cell surface wants to be recognized by TCR and the TCR start to recruit other molecules and uh, engage the other partner. And eventually they will have the molecular condensation and then will trigger the signal transduction. And this kind of sig signal transduction wonder, once you understand the, the detail of the molecules inside, you can even reconstitute the process. So by that, in the past, the Xiaolie Su from Ron Wells lab at UCSF were able to reconstitute the signal activation by adding the protein one by one on the supported lipid bilayer. And when the protein engage with each other, once the kinase come, phosphorylation trigger the conformation of change and the molecular interaction, the downstream signaling can be activated. Eventually, they recruit the acting polymerization factor, WASP, and up to three to trigger the acting polymerization. So this is a kind of way we can think about how the activation of this whole signaling uh, circuit, starting from initial point to the downstream uh, signal output. And uh, inside the cell, and when we talk about uh, this kind of uh, signal transduction, we are trying to think about the micromolecular assembly. And usually in the past, the people used a lot of term called the liquid liquid phase separation. And uh, that is the way to talk about how the molecular can work all together and glue them together in a liquid property. So, but uh, this kind of molecular condensation, actually molecular condensation may be a, a, a more appropriate term to talk about the molecular assembly because not every single molecule are in the liquid phase. And uh, the idea behind is the cell, you have a lot of proteins. They, they do not necessarily 
to work with each other to activate anything because otherwise for the, the immune system probably become like the autoimmune. And, uh, but when you have the signal start to come in and a lot of reaction can happen by having the chemical cue or molecular cue start to interact with each other. So you start to form those kind of condensates. The condensates in the nuclear plasm for the transcription or condensates in the cytoplasm, for example, in the plant cell can be like our, the stress granule or photobodies. And also a lot of membrane-less organelles can actually form the next to the membrane. So my research very much focus on how to, how those membrane-less organelles are formed on the membrane. It's membrane-bonded state and how this kind of membrane-bonded state condenses can tune the assembly and the property of the condenses to control the biochemical activity and output. So the fundamental things behind this kind of molecular condensation is talking about the interaction, inter and intra molecular interaction. And eventually once they form the material property will control the function, the assembly level will control the function and the output. So the molecular can have uh, all kinds of interaction motifs, weaker or stronger, we can, we can simplify them as a sticker. And then they also have the flexible region, usually are those are kind of IDR regions. They provide the confirmation of flexibility and also they provide some uh, folding uh, to facilitate the folding. And uh, when the signal comes, some of the molecules, some of the motif, the, stock, the stickers start to interact with each other. And then they can have a cooperative binding to recruit more and more protein. So the initial state is the nucleation state. You start to differentiate the dilute phase and the dense phase at the nanoscale. And then this kind of nanoscale condenses eventually can go through to the micro scale or even go for the mesoscale based on the each protein, based on the binding partner. And usually they can go by the fusion. This we call it a coalescence, or we can go by sucking the small kind of droplet or the seeds into the big droplet. This is called a kind of oswood ripening in the polymorphics term. And this kind of a condensation of size or the property are controlled by many things, by their interaction and also by the surface tension, also by the surrounding environment. And sometimes in the biology, even more complicated by polymorphics is that we have a lot of post-translational modification and we, we can also call it like an aging process for some uh, 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 problematic proteins. They can even go for the gelation and they can go for the fibril. By that, they will cause the problem. But in a lot of physiological, signaling triggering event we are sitting at the scale of nano to the micro scale they probably don't go for that large and especially on the two-dimensional surface so what behind that we're trying to understand is uh, how those kind of molecular condensates are formed we think they are the herbs herbs to start the signal transduction and at the beginning they should be staying at the resting state the resting state can be their monomer or can be their low order oligomer those are very high affinity bonded state. But when you have the signaling come and they will be stimulated, they start to have the assembly by those kind of scaffolder protein, increase the multivalent assembly and bind to the other protein. So we think this kind of assembly is the way to trigger the reaction and trigger the, uh, uh, like the biochemical and the signaling output. So my laboratory in the past years trying to understand in between the pathogen and the host, how do they communicate with each other? What kind of molecule can be perceived by the host and how this perceived molecule can cause the molecular condensation or induce molecular condensation either in a favor to the pathogen for the attack or in a favor to the plant for the immunity. And we have started different kinds of molecules, for example, like PEMP, people are familiar with and all the effector and we also started a lipid molecule, for example, like a quantum sensing molecule has the lipid fatty, uh, the long fatty acid chain like a structure from uh, the microbe and all the ultra membrane uh, physicals. And those kind of molecules can be perceived by the host and the host has a very striking layer at the front facing the microbe. We call it the cell wall plus a membrane set of skeleton continuum. And uh, they are interconnected and uh, this kind of scaffolding structure provide a mechanical property to control the regulatory molecule on the cell surface, how they perceive the pathogen molecule and how they're going to form the condensation to trigger the reaction. So here, and in the past year, we're trying to understand the input and the output of this kind of signaling. 
The input can be the passage molecule or some very strong signal inside the plant. And the output, we try to understand what kind of molecule will be triggered to form a signaling hub and to transduce the signal to the downstream process. And today, I will mainly focus on two stories. And that's are the, this uh, seminar about is a plant cell focused story. And uh, we talked about how the forming, the integrating like protein in the plant cell and how the nano domain assembly are uh, important to regulate the immune signaling and actin polymerization. So first, uh, like I said, what fascinate, fascinated us is like uh, the spatial temporal regulation of this kind of interaction, communication in between the pathogen and the host. And we want to understand the biochemical reaction. We want to identify the molecule. Uh, because of the background of the cytoskeleton uh, in myself during the postdoc, so I was very interested to look at how the plant received the signal and trigger the acting reaction and the polymerization. And uh, this kind of foundation has been established by Chris Dagger lab in the past, and they found a very interesting uh, a pattern. It's like when you have the early immune response, the acting polymerization can increase a lot. And at a later stage of the infection by the, the effector injection, you see a lot of cross-linking of the actin polymerization. So what kind of a thing behind to control this kind of signaling we're trying to figure it out? Based on the phenotype here, we can hypothesize maybe at the early stage it's come from the nucleation to generate more actin filament. And then maybe at the later stage, it's come from the cross-linking and all the stabilization of actin filament. So based on those kind of assumptions and the hypothesis, we're trying to identify the molecule. And today I'm going to mainly focus on the PTI reaction at the early stage of infection, understand how the molecular condensation of molecule can trigger the actin remodeling. So actin remodeling come from <clears throat> uh, initiated by nucleation factor. In the plant, we have a nucleation factor called the forming protein sitting on the plasma membrane. Outside, it binds to the cell wall. Inside, it binds to the actin uh, filaments. And uh, there's another set of protein called a uh, remodeling protein. These are nano domain regulatory proteins. They can form a nano domain, can cause the property change of plasma membrane, can engage the sterile and the sphingolipid. And they usually do not work too much with each other. But upon the immune signaling, we find uh, the PTI can activate their interaction and make the condensation. And that condensation will trigger the reaction. So this is we talk about the resting state and activated state. So usually to understand the micromolecular assembly, we need a lot of technology to understand the fundamental uh, things behind. So usually we can use the cell biology or immunology approach to understand the phenotype. Once we find the molecule, we were trying to identify the biochemical property, biophysical property, or use the structural biology approach. And when we get a protein, we're trying to, trying to see whether we can recapture the whole process to, to make the signaling circuit like uh, work as it uh, does inside the cell, so we can do the reconstitution. <clears throat> Sometimes we, once we get a lot of molecular, we're trying to use the modeling approach to understand the micromolecular assembly. So here I'm going to show you at the beginning the cell biology level of the knowledge we can generate and to understand this process. So this is the variable angle uh, total internal refraction microscope. We look at the cell surface of the plant and those green fluorescence uh, signal are the forming protein. And we found the forming protein actually can form a nanoscale cluster or condensates upon the activation by the uh, flagellum peptide or just the, uh, the pathogen infection. And this kind of condensation requires remodeling protein. If we delete the remodeling protein and this kind of condensation is abolished at the early stage of the infection. And then interestingly, the remodeling protein per se by itself is also undergo this kind of a condensating condensation process and in a time-dependent manner at the early stage of infection. So then when we're trying to look at these two molecules inside the cell, we find that at the resting state, they have a very weak association with each other and work on their own. But upon the PTI activation, and they start to engage each other and form a nanoscale condensate on the surface. And this kind of condensation actually is the driving force to change the actin polymerization we saw at the early stage. <clears throat> And then after that, we're trying to understand how does this process go and what's the biochemical reaction happen. So we're trying to reconstitute the process. And to the reconstitution, we very much like to use the bottom-up biology approach. Not, not we can always uh, to recapture the whole process, but we're trying to use the minimum component to recapture the minimum circuit of the signal transduction. 
So here we use the support lipid bilayer system. We make a lipid bilayer, then we put the protein on top. We're trying to make the protein linked to the lipid bilayer from their, um, the original conformation. For example, forming protein, <clears throat> we link the forming and terminal to the lipid bilayer to mimic the TMD domain. And for the remoting protein, we link it to the lipid bilayer by the cysteine to mimic its uh, palmitylation site. By that, we keep them as the native conformation and that they can interact with each other. So when we do a lot of titration, do a stoichiometry testing, we can understand how they work with each other and engage to form a condensate. And surprisingly, this kind of condensation form on the lipid bilayer and also will trigger the biochemical activity of the forming. It will enhance the nucleation. So by that, we understand when they form um, uh, nano domain, nano uh, the accumulation, the cluster, they can activate the forming by the PTI signaling. So, and uh, secondary, the next one I want to um, talk about uh, is the second story, also relevant to the nano domain. We published on the same issue to talk about how the ultra membrane vesicle communicated with the plant cells. And uh, OME have been started uh, as an immunoregulator in both the mammalian system and in the plant system, and uh, have been known to upregulate the immunity to protect the plant. And however, how does OME enter the host and uh, to change the immunity was still not very clear. And some of the evidence showed the PAMP, uh, the elicitor inside the OME can contribute that, and some could be the mRNA. So we also find this a new mechanism, and we also identify how does OME enter the host. And this study, we found that when OME start to uh, protect the plant, and this kind of protection actually could be abolished or prevented by the remaining mutants. So in terms of that, we think the nano domain could play the important role on the line OME mediate the, the immune enhancement. And uh, one of the surprising results we have is when we do cell biology, we're trying to put the OMB onto the host to see the uptake. And we did not observe clear internalization of OMB signal. So that was surprising. And even with cell wall or uh, no cell wall, just a pyroplast, they can engage on the plasma membrane, but no internalization. That means some stabilization machinery must be there to keep OMB on the host membrane. And we're trying to understand what's going on on the host memory. And when we look at the imaging of the OME and to understand at the interface in between the bacteria and the host, we find the OME can actually align well and form uh, the kind of condensate dots on the remote nano domains. So that's mean OME are entering the host mediated by remote form nano domain. And when we look at the membrane property of the uh, plasma membrane of the plant cell. And we find uh, the plant cell has enriched the odor. Enriched the odor means like the enriched, uh, the enhanced packaging of the plasma membrane by adding OMB. And this kind of enhanced uh, lipid odor also will be abolished if we use the, uh, so if we remove the remoting from the plants. So that is kind of intriguing things because some membrane property has been changed. That could be a reason to understand the immuno moderation by the OME to the host. But how does the order change? This is a kind of a question. Whether this kind of order increase of the lipid is offered by the OME directly, or it's a host response to change something. And when we do the lipid lipidomics to talk about the OME and also the host, and we find the OME are highly enriched in the order than the saturated lipid. So our hypothesis is the OME used the saturated lipid inserted onto the membrane, then they will squeeze the membrane property on the plasma membrane of the plant. Then they will change this kind of odor and the immunoto uh, and the surface receptors actually. And the, the plant per se on the other side, actually the odor is also very important. If you have the sterile, we find it can engage the OMB, but if you don't have the sterile, it cannot engage the OMB very well. So this is why the plant without the uh, uh, nano domain cannot uptake the OMB very well. So we, we use the simulation approach by collaborating with a, a Huang lab at NTU. And we found that if we use the condition of OMB, we did, uh, uh, we identified that from lipidolomics and the plant uh, lipidolomics, we can see OMB can fuse with the plant upon a certain point and it can change the biomolecular. But if we don't have the sterile on the plasma membrane, the OME just uh, 
softly engage with them, but there's not much fusion event. So by that, we, our the understanding is that when we uh, uptake by the plant through the nano domain engaged, and this kind of lipid property in between two parties are very important. And eventually once the OMB onto the membrane of the plasma membrane of the host, that will change the property and control the immune response to a lot of other things. And, and uh, so uh, this is my last slide, and I want to acknowledge the people working in the lab on this project. Uh, one is our um, former postdoc, Tuan Chen, and uh, he is now uh, has his own group in the US, and also uh, my former PhD, Jimmy Ma. And I also thank the collaborators working with us on the simulation and on the homophrite imaging and on the, a lot of plant remoting stuff. And also thanks the funding agency uh, at Singapore and also the EMBO support. And thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions. All right, thank you again, Yen Song, for a very nice talk. Now we open for question, okay? Please type in your question in the chat box or in the Q&A boxes, okay? So while we're waiting for the question, I think Yen Song had just start with one question. You had a training, right? You didn't have any training in the plant defense. So how okay. come your, your, your PhD training is trafficking, postdoc training in yeast? Why suddenly you were under the plant defense? So yeah, it, it's a very interesting question and very good one. Actually, I I would think uh, first I think uh, like uh, the training is like uh, uh, the the interest. I always like uh, when I working in the Dr. Jans lab. Also, a lot of interesting questions so we start to think about. Uh, not necessary to say we need to publish something, but those questions come to the mind that give us the flexibility to think about how we can adjust them. And then when we go to uh, the California and then the Human Frontier Fellow also asked me, require actually change the field. And uh, the people working at the UC, uh, it's just like uh, they're amazing. Uh, those kind of engineering people, uh, physics people, chemistry people, you stay in that kind of in, uh, the environment you are influenced a lot. And when I come to Singapore, uh, the people surrounding me also a lot of uh, structural biology simulation people. So I like to chat with them and all those kind of things engage all together. Eventually I find something interesting for myself. So this is probably is slowly uh, uh, built. All right, good to know that. Okay, there's a one question in the Q&A box. Could ROS and nitrine oxidize regulate actin condensation? Okay, this is a uh, very interesting question. So we break down this kind of question in two things. One is like uh, whether they can modulate the condensation for the actin regulator protein or whether they can control the actin filament. So actin does has a two uh, oxidation side at the 284 and the three, uh, uh, 287 and 374, and they are conserved. Those kind of oxidation side, they can be regulated by uh, RS directly to change the actin polymerization. And the condensation, we're talking about the actin regulatory proteins. So oxidation always happen. And though also there's an early time, there's a natural chemical biology paper published from Li Pi Long from Tsinghua, also talking about how the RS will change the condensation. A lot of protein, can be sensitive to the RS or the RNS in vitro and in vivo. So those kind of conditions always there and they could tune the condensation for sure. And how they precisely tune the condensation to control the biochemical output, we still don't know yet. We are just starting uh, to understand those at this moment, but it's a very good question. Thanks. All right, Yan so at the early part of your talk, you saw this uh, after infection, you know, the fragilitin, 22, and then you see this patch, right? This, uh, mm -hmm. So are they dynamic? Do they move this patch in the plant? Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, this is talking about uh, the this condensation. Presumably, you say there's a condensation. Yeah, those condensation, some of them move. Some of them has no movement. It's based on the property. Sometimes the more the molecule can be engaged into the non-movement, the molecule. But uh, during this assembly process, actually the movement also changing because it is based on the condensation property and it's also will be controlled by the lipid. Actually, condensation will change the lipid. The lipid will change the condensation. Everything on the membrane will 
will, will go towards a kind of equilibrium state, but they are kind of non-equilibrium. But uh, during that process, that is why it's interesting is in space and in time. It's changing all the time. And uh, this dynamic is critical. We always need to understand the dynamic of those molecules. Then we can understand which state they are. Are they going to assemble or they are not going to assemble? Yeah, this is a key parameter to understand the process. So do you have any EM image showing the structure of that? Yeah, that this, <laughs> this is something. I, I, I know that they're, that they are condensation rather than West Coast. Yeah, this is something we really like to do. And so far, and based on the, the, our understanding, those protein bind to the membrane, but they don't uh, form any like enclosed uh, bilayer. And uh, we want to do the EM or at one day, maybe some quiet tomograph, we can understand the, the beta. At this moment, uh, we don't have this evidence yet. <laughs> or do you also try to co-express with some of the organelle marker, see whether they have any Co-localization, dynamic association, yeah. that, that would, would have some of the answer to that, right? Possible. So based on the assembly kind of a theory, this kind of assembly based on the interaction, weak or stronger, and also based on the status of the micromolecular assembly. A lot of vesicle could be engaged at the point if the vesicle has the displayed protein outside and those displayed region are flexible or can be interacted with other proteins, they, be, they can be engaged. Not necessary to be the lipid-lipid interaction, but uh, more or less will be primarily based on the protein-protein interaction. Okay, so then I think that, let's see, there's no other question. I think I would like to ask a general question on that phase separation field, right? I think most of the data are generated using the in vitro system, right? The test field or this one. What do you think and that really happened in, in living cell in vivo, are they, almost the same or are they identical are they some of them may not be real what what, what, what would be your common so this is a very good and very challenging question actually in the biology trying to solve the first uh, when we understand this kind of a conversation we usually trying to identify the scaffolder and the client many of the scaffolder means that we're trying to identify the key molecule they are multivalent and they can bind to the other and form the, the, the interaction so those kind of molecules, if you can identify, usually it's easier to be reconstituted in vitro and uh, by the in vitro assay, either with the crowded agent or without crowded agent. But that kind of a property should in vitro just to show you molecular interaction and the multivalent interaction. It does not necessarily always happen in vivo because in vivo it can have other binding partners that can pull them apart. So in vivo, once you have more and more molecular, you need to balance the condensation force and the pulling force and the equilibrium. So if other molecules are going to dissolve them or prevent them, uh, prevent their interaction into the self-assembly, they will not form condensates. But the other polymer, if they want to make it to assemble into condensates, they will go for that. So usually it's relatively easy to see those kind of stress granule or the old RNA because the nucleotide is a very good polyelectrolyte polymers. Those kind of polymer contain so many sides and interaction positions. So those kind of feature offer them at a certain moment, they will form a micromolecular condensation. But for the other protein, even though you see the drop rate in vitro, not necessarily you always see the same size in vivo, or maybe they even don't see them, but there are some condition based. The reaction behind is there, but whether you have such reaction inside the cell depends on the condition. All right, there's one question in the, another one in the Q and A box. Uh, let's say, who's the, does the morning have actin binding domain or is not needed to have for actin nucleation? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. We tested that. Actually, it does not bind to actin directly. And uh, it also does not nuclear actin di directly. We test the biochemistry, yeah. All right, well, not another one. Do you have an idea? Can you quantify the number of uh, bacteria of the GRA receptor molecule interactions at the membrane resulting in an immune response by a single plant cell? Uh, sorry, uh, can, can you, you repeat again? By yourself in the Q&A? Q &A? I'm trying to find the, where is the box uh, Q&A. Is there? Pick the Q&A box if it should open. Open. 
quantify the number of the bacteria yeah, affecting yeah, the receptor I, I, molecule I, I, infection at the membrane that result. That would be the last question. <laughs> okay, okay. So I would say uh, we could uh, try to quantify that at the single uh, cell label because uh, when you do image, you can look at the single cell. And if you want to quantify that, you need to know uh, the molecular. You can do the, uh, the imaging by the, the FLS2, uh, the GFP, but if you want to know the active receptor can receive the a partner, you can also do kind of a dual color by, light, by, by label your ligand with another fluorophore. And the, if you do the fluorophore of the ligand and the receptor, you can, uh, can identify the active site upon a certain moment or the condition. I think that the site will change the activity based on the condition of the cell. All right. Thanks again, Yansong and Belhan for the excellent talks. Mary, now pass by. Mm -hmm. Time to you. Thank you, Luen, for uh, hosting this. And thank you, both speakers. Um, I have to say this was very exciting. Uh, I really enjoyed both talks. Um, I kind of wish I could start my PhD all over again and, you know, take advantage of these amazing techniques and technologies you described. Um, please check out the articles in the January 2022 focus issue of Plant Cell. Remember, we have another uh, webinar based on the same focus issue on the 25th. I can also mention that the Plant Physiology Journal has a focus issue called the Plant Cell Atlas, and we'll have a webinar featuring some of those authors on February 10th. So I guess we can say it's a great time to be a plant cell biologist. So thank you all. Thank you, audience. Enjoyed very much, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you again. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.